The Pearl by John Steinbeck Chapter 1 Kino awakened in the near dark. The stars still shone, and the day had drawn only a pale wash of light in the lower sky to the east. The roosters had been crowing for some time, and the early pigs were already beginning their ceaseless turning of twigs and bits of wood to see whether anything to eat had been overlooked. Outside the brush house in the tuna clump, a covey of little birds chittered and flurried with their wings. Kino's eyes opened, and he looked first at the lightning square, which was the door, and then he looked at the hanging box where Coyotito slept. And last, he turned his head to Juana, his wife, who lay beside him on the mat, her blue head shawl over her nose and over her breasts and around the small of her back. Juana's eyes were open too. Kino could never remember seeing them closed when he awakened. Her dark eyes made little reflected stars. She was looking at him as she was always looking at him when he awakened. Kino heard the little splash of morning waves on the beach. It was very good. Kino closed his eyes again to listen to his music. Perhaps he alone did this, and perhaps all of his people did it. His people had once been great makers of songs so that everything they saw or thought or did or heard became a song. That was very long ago. The songs remained. Kino knew them, but no new songs were added. That does not mean that there were no personal songs. In Kino's head, there was a song now, clear and soft, and if he had been able to speak of it, he would have called it the Song of the Family. His blanket was over his nose to protect him from the dank air. His eyes flicked to a rustle beside him. It was Juana arising, almost soundlessly. On her hard, bare feet, she went to the hanging box where Coyotito slept, and she leaned over and said a little reassuring word. Coyotito looked up for a moment and closed his eyes and slept again. Juana went to the fire pit and uncovered a coal and fanned it alive while she broke little pieces of brush over it. Now Kino got up and wrapped his blanket about his head and nose and shoulders. He slipped his feet into his sandals and went outside to watch the dawn. Outside the door, he squatted down and gathered the blanket about his knees. He saw the specks of gulf clouds flame high in the air, and a goat came near and sniffed at him and stared with its cold yellow eyes. Behind him, Juana's fire leaped into flame and threw spears of light through the chinks of the brush house wall and threw a wavering square of light out the door. A late moth blustered in to find the fire. The song of the family came now from behind Kino, and the rhythm of the family song was the grinding stone where Juana worked the corn for the morning cakes. The dawn came quickly now, a wash, a glow, a lightness, and then an explosion of fire as the sun arose out of the gulf. Kino looked down to cover his eyes from the glare. He could hear the pat of the corn cakes in the house and the rich smell of them on the cooking plate. The ants were busy on the ground, big black ones with shiny bodies and little dusty quick ants.
Tino watched with the detachment of God, while a dusty ant frantically tried to escape the sand trap an ant lion had dug for him. A thin, timid dog came close, and at a soft word from Kino curled up, arranged its tail neatly over its feet, and laid its chin delicately on the pile. It was a black dog with yellow gold spots where its eyebrows should have been. It was a morning like other mornings, and yet perfect among mornings. Kino heard the creak of the rope when Juana took Coyotito out of his hanging box and cleaned him and hammocked him in her shawl in a loop that placed him close to her breast. Kino could see these things without looking at them. Juana sang softly an ancient song that had only three notes and yet endless variety of interval, and this was part of the family song too. It was all part. Sometimes it rose to an aching chord that caught the throat, saying, this is safety, this is warmth, this is the whole. Across the brush fence were other brush houses, and the smoke came from them too, and the sound of breakfast. But those were other songs. Their pigs were other pigs. Their wives were not Juana. Kino was young and strong, and his black hair hung over his brown forehead. His eyes were warm and fierce and bright, and his mustache was thin and coarse. He lowered his blanket from his nose now, for the dark, poisonous air was gone, and the yellow sunlight fell on the house. Near the brush fence, two roosters bowed and fainted at each other with squared wings and neck feathers roughed out. It would be a clumsy fight. They were not game chickens. Kino watched them for a moment, and then his eyes went up to a flight of wild doves twinkling inland to the hills. The world was awake now, and Kino arose and went into his brush house. As he came through the door, Juana stood up from the glowing fire pit. She put Coyotito back in his hanging box, and then she combed her black hair and braided it in two braids and tied the ends with thin green ribbon. Kino squatted by the fire pit and rolled a hot corn cake and dipped it in sauce and ate it, and he drank a little purut and that was breakfast. That was the only breakfast he had ever known outside of feast days and one incredible fiesta on cookies that had nearly killed him. When Kino had finished, Juana came back to the fire and ate her breakfast. They had spoken once, but there is not need for speech if it is only a habit anyway. Kino sighed with satisfaction and that was conversation. The sun was warming the brush house, breaking through its crevices in long streaks, and one of the streaks fell on the hanging box where Coyotito lay and on the rope that held it. It was a tiny movement that drew their eyes to the hanging box. Kino and Juana froze in their positions. Down the rope, that hung the baby's box from the roof support, a scorpion moved slowly. His stinging tail was straight out behind him, but he could whip it up in a flash of time. Kino's breath whistled in his nostrils, and he opened his mouth to stop it. And then the startled look was gone from him, and the rigidity from his body. In his mind, a new song had come, the song of evil, the music of the enemy, of any foe of the family, a savage, secret, dangerous melody, and underneath, the song of the family.
cried plaintively. The scorpion moved delicately down the rope toward the box. Under her breath, Juana repeated an ancient magic to guard against such evil, and on top of that she muttered a Hail Mary between clenched teeth. But Kino was in motion. His body glided quietly across the room, noiselessly and smoothly. His hands were in front of him, palms down, and his eyes were on the scorpion. Beneath it, in the hanging box, Coyotito laughed and reached up his hand toward it. It sensed danger when Kino was almost within reach of it. It stopped, and its tail rose up over its back in little jerks, and the curved thorn on the tail's end glistened. Kino stood perfectly still. He could hear Juana whispering the old magic again, and he could hear the evil music of the enemy. He could not move until the scorpion moved, and it felt for the source of the death that was coming to it. Kino's hand went forward very slowly, very smoothly. The thorned tail jerked upright, and at that moment, the laughing Coyotito shook the rope and the scorpion fell. Kino's hand leaped to catch it, but it fell past his fingers, fell on the baby's shoulder, landed, and struck. Then, snarling, Kino had it, had it in his fingers, rubbing it to a paste in his hands. He threw it down and beat it into the earth floor with his fist, and Coyotito screamed with pain in his box. But Kino beat and stamped the enemy until it was only a fragment and a moist place in the dirt. His teeth were bared and fury flared in his eyes, and the song of the enemy roared in his ears. But Juana had the baby in her arms now. She found the puncture with redness starting from it already. She put her lips down over the puncture and sucked hard and spat and sucked again while Coyotito screamed. Kino hovered. He was helpless. He was in the way. The screams of the baby brought the neighbors. Out of their brush houses they poured. Kino's brother Juan, Toma, and his fat wife Apollonia and their four children crowded in the door and blocked the entrance, while behind them others tried to look in, and one small boy crawled among legs to have a look, and those in front passed the word back to those behind. Scorpion, the baby has been stung. Juana stopped sucking the puncture for a moment. The little hole was slightly enlarged, and its edges whitened from the sucking, but the red swelling extended farther around it in a hard, lymphatic mound. And all of these people knew about the scorpion. An adult might be very ill from the sting, but a baby could easily die from the poison. First, they knew, would come swelling and fever and tightened throat, and then cramps in the stomach. And then Coyotito might die if enough of the poison had gone in. But the stinging pain of the bite was going away. Coyotito's screams turned to moans. Kino had wondered often at the iron in his patient, fragile wife. She who was obedient and respectful and cheerful and patient, she could arch her back in child pain with hardly a cry. She could stand fatigue and hunger almost better than Kino himself. In the canoe, she was like a strong man. And now, she did a most surprising thing. The doctor, she said. Go get the doctor. The word was passed out among the neighbors where they stood close-packed in the little yard behind the brush fence. And they repeated among themselves, Juana wants the doctor. A wonderful thing, a memorable thing, to want the doctor. 
To get him would be a remarkable thing. The doctor never came to the cluster of brush houses. Why should he? When he had more than he could do to take care of the rich people who lived in the stone and plaster houses of the town. He would not come, the people in the yard said. He would not come, the people in the door said, and the thought got into Kino. The doctor would not come, Kino said to Wana. She looked up at him, her eyes as cold as the eyes of a lioness. This was Wana's first baby. This was nearly everything there was in Wana's world. And Kino saw her determination and the music of the family sounded in his head with a steely tone. Then we will go to him, Wana said. And with one hand, she arranged her dark blue shawl over her head and made of one end of it a sling to hold the moaning baby and made of the other end of it a shade over his eyes to protect him from the light. The people in the door pushed against those behind to let her through. Kino followed her. They went out of the gate to the rutted path and the neighbors followed them. The thing had become a neighborhood affair. They made a quick, soft-footed procession into the center of the town. First Juana and Kino, and behind them Juan Tuma and Apollonia, her big stomach jiggling with the strenuous pace. Then all the neighbors with the children trotting on the flanks, and the yellow sun threw their black shadows ahead of them so that they walked on their own shadows. They came to the place where the brush houses stopped and the city of stone and plaster began, the city of harsh outer walls and inner cool gardens where a little water played and the bougainvillea crusted the walls with purple and brick red and white. They heard from the secret gardens the singing of caged birds and heard the splash of cooling water on hot flagstones. The procession crossed the blinding plaza and passed in front of the church. It had grown now, and on the outskirts, the hurrying newcomers were being softly informed how the baby had been stung by a scorpion, how the father and mother were taking it to the doctor. And the newcomers, particularly the beggars from the front of the church who were great experts in financial analysis, looked quickly at Juana's old blue skirt, saw the tears in her shawl, appraised the green ribbon on her braids, read the age of Kino's blanket and the thousand washings of his clothes, and set them down as poverty people, and went along to see what kind of drama might develop. The four beggars in front of the church knew everything in the town, they were students of the expressions of young women as they went into confession, and they saw them as they came out and read the nature of the sin. They knew every little scandal and some very big crimes. They slept at their posts in the shadow of the church so that no one crept in for consolation without their knowledge, and they knew the doctor. They knew his ignorance, his cruelty, his avarice, his appetites, his sins. They knew his clumsy abortions and the little brown pennies he gave sparingly for alms. They had seen his corpses go into the church. And since early mass was over and business was slow, they followed the procession, these endless searchers after perfect knowledge of their fellow men, to see what the fat, lazy doctor would do about an indigent baby with a scorpion bite. The scurrying procession came at last to the big gate in the wall of the doctor's house. They could hear the splashing water and the singing of caged birds and the sweep of the long brooms on the flagstones, and they could smell the frying of good bacon from the doctor's house. Kino hesitated a moment. This doctor was not of his people. This doctor was of a race which, for nearly 400 years, 
had beaten and starved and robbed and despised Kino's race and frightened it too, so that the indigene came humbly to the door. And as always, when he came near to one of this race, Kino felt weak and afraid and angry at the same time. Rage and terror went together. He could kill the doctor more easily than he could talk to him, for all of the doctor's race spoke to all of Kino's race as though they were simple animals. And as Kino raised his right hand to the iron ring knocker in the gate, Rage swelled in him, and the pounding music of the enemy beat in his ears, and his lips drew tight against his teeth. But with his left hand, he reached to take off his hat. The iron ring pounded against the gate. Kino took off his hat and stood waiting. Coyotito moaned a little in Juana's arms, and she spoke softly to him. The procession crowded close, the better to see and hear. After a moment, the big gate opened a few inches. Kino could see the green coolness of the garden and little splashing fountain through the opening. The man who looked out at him was one of his own race. Kino spoke to him in the old language. The little one, the firstborn, has been poisoned by the scorpion, Kino said. He requires the skill of the healer. The gate closed a little, and the servant refused to speak in the old language. A little moment, he said. I go to inform myself. And he closed the gate and slid the bolt home. The glaring sun threw the bunched shadows of the people blackly on the white wall. In his chamber, the doctor sat up in his high bed. He had on his dressing gown of red-watered silk that had come from Paris. A little tight over the chest now, if it was buttoned. On his lap was a silver tray with a silver chocolate pot and a tiny cup of eggshell china, so delicate that it looked silly when he lifted it with his big hand lifted it with the tips of thumb and forefinger and spread the other three fingers wide to get them out of the way. His eyes rested in puffy little hammocks of flesh and his mouth drooped with discontent. He was growing very stout and his voice was hoarse with the fat that pressed on his throat. Beside him on a table was a small oriental gong and a bowl of cigarettes. The furnishings of the room were heavy and dark and gloomy. The pictures were religious, even the large tinted photograph of his dead wife, who, if masses willed and paid for out of her own estate could do it, was in heaven. The doctor had once for a short time been a part of the great world, and his whole subsequent life was memory and longing for France. That, he said was civilized living, by which he meant that on a small income he had been able to keep a mistress and eat in restaurants. He poured his second cup of chocolate and crumbled a sweet biscuit in his fingers. The servant from the gate came to open the door and stood waiting to be noticed. Yes, the doctor asked. It is a little Indian with a baby. He says a scorpion stung it. The doctor put his cup down gently before he let his anger rise. Have I nothing better to do than cure insect bites for little Indians? I'm a doctor, not a veterinary. Yes, patron, said the servant. Has he any money? The doctor demanded. No, they never have any money. I, I alone in the world, am supposed to work for nothing, and I'm tired of it. See if he has any money. At the gate, the servant opened the door a trifle and looked out at the waiting people, and this time he spoke in the old language. Have you money to pay for the treatment? Now Kino reached into a secret place somewhere under his blanket. He brought out a paper folded many times. Crease by crease he unfolded it, 
until at last there came to view eight small misshapen seed pearls as ugly and gray as little ulcers flattened and almost valueless the servant took the paper and closed the gate again but this time he was not gone long he opened the gate just wide enough to pass the paper back the doctor has gone out he said he was called to a serious case and he shut the gate quickly out of shame and now a wave of shame went over the whole procession. They melted away. The beggars went back to the church steps. The stragglers moved off, and the neighbors departed so that the public shaming of Kino would not be in their eyes. For a long time, Kino stood in front of the gate with Juana beside him. Slowly, he put his suppliant hat back on his head. Then... Without warning, he struck the gate a crushing blow with his fist. He looked down in wonder at his split knuckles and at the blood that flowed down between his fingers. <laughs>